This is a bonus episode of the Death to Tyrants podcast. The crushing weight of the tyrant's passage had left nothing unmarked. You can't split in fucking half, but I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash a science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again to the Death to Tyrants podcast as always i am your host and humble narrator buck johnson and not as always i've got a co-host this evening joining me i say this evening maybe it's morning time where you're listening to this so uh good morning however it's evening here and i've got one of my good friends bobby pearson here to help co-host this bonus episode it's a bonus episode so i can do whatever the hell i want bobby how are you hey thanks thanks for having me thanks for considering me as a part of your bonus episode yeah, well, tell everyone out there uh, that's going, who's this guy? Tell them about you. Who's this guy? Okay, um, yeah, I am a relatively recently um, student of uh, Rothbard and um, Mises and those types of guys. Met Buck through a mutual group here in Austin where we were trying to start campaigning for Jacob Hornberger. And um when I'm not diving into those types of literatures, I'm uh, recording a podcast of my own called the Not For Everyone podcast. Great break from anything political, not remotely political. It's two cynical man children discussing their friendship through the lens of obscure cult and horror movies. So if that strikes anyone's uh, interest, check out Not For Everyone podcast. Well, there you go. See, this is the uh, the cool thing about the bonus episodes is I can break the normal pattern of uh, the theme of the show a little bit because this is still, I look at a lot of these shows as, as red pilling uh, people and I've been told, hey, you should um, get people that aren't necessarily in line 100% with your politics on the show. And so I'm doing that. And then of course, I've got a co-host uh, who has a podcast about movies, something that he knows very well that I know really poorly. So what we're doing on this show is having Megan Murphy back on the show. You guys probably remember her. Way back in 2018, she was on the show when everyone could move about freely and go to restaurants, bars. Remember those days? Well, Megan's back with us, and I'll just give a quick summary of her story from before. She has been banned from Twitter. Uh, she's probably the most famous feminist in Canada. And she had some run-ins with some people. Basically, she's saying uh, some trans people tried to infiltrate, maybe you could say, the feminist movement. And all she did was say, look, you're not a woman, you're a man. And boy, you would think that's not too controversial, but it was. She's had uh, a lot of backlash over the few years. And uh, we welcome her with open arms. And Again, it's we don't always agree politically, and that's fine. I think if we discussed economics, we would have some uh, debate on that particular topic. But she's very smart, and she's a red-pilled leftist, and th she's experienced some crazy stuff. So I wanted to welcome her back to the show. And uh, let me tell you about her really quick. Megan Murphy is a freelance writer and journalist and is founder and editor of Feminist Current. She's got a master's degree in the Department of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies at Simon Fraser University back in 2012. She's back on the show. Megan Murphy, all the way up from Canada. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing okay, considering. <laughs> yeah. What's it? Uh, you're up in Canada, correct? Yeah. I'm in Vancouver, BC, which is in Canada. And actually, as far as places to be during all this pandemic stuff. It's great. Um, BC is doing really well. Uh, we haven't had that many cases and deaths as compared to the US, for example, and even some other provinces in Canada. We sort of succeeded in flattening the curve, as it were. So we're starting to open things up again this week. Actually, I just uh, went to get uh, pedicure today. <laughs> excellent. Well, it, yeah. it was excellent. <laughs> those those can be essential. Um, That's it's on my in, list. It's interesting. Pretty that, excited. <laughs> it's interesting that you said flattening the curve and things opened up. I assume you're aware here that there's kind of an issue back and forth between 
they said flatten the curve and everything will be good. And now the curve's flattened in a lot of areas and some of the states are still locked down. Is that making the news up there? Um, I haven't followed what's going on so much from state to state. And it seems like things are changing so quickly around the world in terms of the way that various countries are deciding to open things up or not and the different levels or stages or whatever. You know, we have four four stages of opening up. Um, in BC, and it seems like they also have like le- four levels in New Zealand. So uh, th- I haven't followed super closely exactly what's going on in the U.S. Are you guys? And I assume that it's different from state to state too, depending on the situation. So what's what's going on there? We are in Texas, yeah, and you're right. It's different uh, state to state here, which is nice that that they're allowing kind of the as it used to be called the uh, uh, 50 laboratories of democracy. In Texas, we are opened up. And honestly, here in Austin, um, Bobby, you can speak on this too. It doesn't seem too weird at this point. I've been to a few restaurants. I've been to, I, today I got my hair cut. Tomorrow I'm going to the gym. It's almost normal. I would say traffic has returned to normal. Bobby, your thoughts on that? Um, honestly, I, I, I didn't really enjoy leaving the house to begin with. So this is kind <laughs> of okay with me. It's not, uh, I, I drove around, it seems like there's more people out and uh, the mask thing seems to be dwindling a yes. little bit or at least to my uh, understanding or impression. Yeah. To, mm, today, yeah, I mean, we're just ramping up the mask thing here, which I feel irritated by, to be honest, because I think the whole mask thing is a bit um, silly in many circumstances. Um Especially because, you know, like I'm talking about the fabric masks, mm-hmm. not the not the medical grade or surgical masks even, but just these fabric kind of fashion masks that people are wearing around. I mean, like it makes sense if you're going to be up close to somebody and maybe coughing in their face. But if I mean, if you're coughing, you shouldn't be up close to anybody. <laughs> but, you know, like if you know, there's no reason to be wearing some fabric mask when you're walking around outside. I mean, again, like in Vancouver, in BC in general, we're sort of in a good, good spot because it's not a super densely populated area. So, you know, this whole time I've still been out and about, you know, almost every day walking around, people have still been out at the park, you know, people, um, are out hanging out outside. It's not that hard to kind of keep your distance from people. So it's not particularly stressful, but just today um, we, it was announced um, by the health authorities in BC that, and by Justin Trudeau actually that, you know, people should be wearing masks, you know, if it's impossible to social distance, they say, which is fair, but we're all social distancing. I mean, we're sort of, we have to like, you know, the way that stores and restaurants and bars and all these services, the way that they're opening up means everyone has to be socially distanced. Um, For the most part, people are still hanging out outside. So I don't know. I guess I like I'm not super into wearing the mask. I find it really hot and uncomfortable and like hard to breathe. And I'm not like around very many people. I work at home, so I don't actually see very many people. So I'm not a super high risk person in terms of infecting other people. I mean, and personally, also, it's, I'm not at a high risk of, of getting infected or um um you know, I'm in good health and things like that, luckily. But I'm just not around enough people for it to be much of a concern. But I, I mean, I, I actually, sorry, I'm, I'm droning on a bit, so feel free to interrupt me. But uh, my mom, she's an American citizen. Um, I was born in Canada and grew up here. Um, I lived here with my family until I was about 19. And my mom finished her PhD here in Vancouver and started applying for jobs at universities. And if you're an academic, of course, you kind of have to be willing to move wherever so she got a job at IU in Bloomington, and she's uh, worked in in Indiana ever since. And my dad went over there and lived there for a while and taught. And maybe like four years or so ago, they bought a place on the island um, here in BC, sort of near Vancouver. And so she 
goes back and forth. So she teaches in Bloomington, Indiana, and then she comes back to their residence here where my dad's living full time in the summers and at Christmas. And she, you know, bought a plane ticket to come back. She checked with everybody that she could check with. She um, had her quarantine plan approved. Um, and, you know, as far as she knew, she was good to go. And she got all the way to Vancouver on Monday and they wouldn't let her leave the airport. So customs took her passport. This is my mom in her like sixties. They took her passport and she has a residence here and she's coming to stay for a few months with my dad and was going to quarantine for 14 days. They took her passport. They wouldn't let her leave the airport until she booked a hotel and a flight back. Wow. Um, and they made wow. her like turn around and leave the next day. There was no conversation. They just kept saying to her, it's non-essential travel. It's non-essential travel. So now she's back at home, stuck there for who knows how long, all alone. My dad's still all alone, isolated on on Salt Spring Island. And I was just like, that was really like the end of my rope for this whole situation. I was just like, this is not cool. Like, you know, she's not going on a vacation, you know, she's coming here in the long term. She has a, they live here, you know, she's here part time, but my dad's here full time. I mean, anyway, so not, I'm not feeling in like great spirits around this whole situation right now. Sure. And you mentioned, uh, this is a good segue, you mentioned the end of the, your rope on this particular situation. Last time we spoke, it was, I looked up, it was uh, December of 2018. And I think the story basically for you at that moment was you were a well-known feminist in Canada and you were getting a lot of pushback from the trans movement and certain kind of corners of what we might call the radical left, although at this point, left and right are so uh, such a mixed gray area, but we'll call it the radical left at that point. Would you sum it up that same way? Uh, Was that basically what was going on with you in late uh, 2018? Yeah, I mean, that was when I got kicked off of Twitter for, um, you know, saying that men aren't women and correctly sexing a man. Um, and, uh, then since then I've just been, I mean, I've been doing a lot of talks, so I've been traveling quite a bit, which has been nice, especially since now we can't travel at all, um, to talk about gender identity and gender identity ideology, gender identity legislation, and the impact on women. So it's been quite busy, um, with, with those events. Uh, I, you know, most of those events have been protested. I did an event in Toronto in the fall that was protested by hundreds and hundreds of people. And that was quite stressful, but you know, at that it's, it's interesting because the media in Canada especially has really refused to cover this issue fairly. Um, certainly they've, they've not acknowledged that are there are real critiques from feminists that um, should be listened to and discussed and debated And, you know, it's only really been because of these events that I've been doing that the media has been forced to finally cover it. So, you know, with all these protests, with all these petitions to shut down my talks and events, um, some journalists in Canada kind of finally started coming out and talking about this as an issue of free speech. And, you know, some of them saying things like, you know, Megan's not saying anything offensive or hateful at all. You know, some of them came to my talk and were like a bit baffled at what the the big deal is because I'm not saying anything. I mean, I don't think I'm saying anything particularly controversial either, right? It's just that so many of these people don't listen or don't read what I actually write and just sort of react based on who they think I am or who they've been told I am by their friends on social media or whatever. And Megan, do you feel like your notoriety has increased um, due to the positive reaction to your stances on these things or do you think it's increased due to the negative or maybe a little bit of both um i mean probably both i mean what's been interesting and enjoyable to me is that because of what happened to me i've been able to i've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of people across the political spectrum and meet a lot of people across the political spectrum and sort of get outside of my bubble which was a pretty lefty feminist bubble. Um, and to 
and you know to explore issues in a new way um, and hear from people who see things in a different way than than maybe I had in the past or certainly differently than than many people that were in my my political circles saw them and but yeah I mean there's definitely been a lot more hate directed my way <laughs> let me ask you this is there does it feel like the Overton window has been pushed tighter by groups like the ones that are opposing you basically is is there a push do you feel that the people want to like look once you say like you, you said what i'm saying doesn't seem that radical but is there a push to get it to where like you can't even say that you've got to squeeze in this narrow window of what's allowable i mean that's what they try to do i don't do that i really do say what i think <laughs> but That is like really shocking to people. Um, People, you know, even even feminists, you know, even sometimes my own kind of supporters will be shocked and angry at me because I'll share an opinion or a perspective that doesn't fit properly within the category or the box of what, um, you know, the box that they think that I should be in. You know, I sort of have started to feel really kind of opposed to all these political labels and these categories because I don't want to be categorized. You know, I don't want to be put in a box. I just want to talk about ideas and policies. And, um, you know, I I think that it's probably more useful to focus on the issues in many cases rather to say I'm a this or I'm a that. You know, technically, I, I think I probably am still a socialist and I'm, I am still a feminist. And, you know, if you look at my actual policy views and things like that, you, you would have to call me that, but I don't like how that's applied and the way it seems that, you know, if you're on the left, you have to um, have this position on this, this, all these various issues and, and you, you can't ask these questions and you can't say these things and you can't use this language and you can't talk to these people. And I just hate it. I just, you know, I want to just be able to be honest and be myself and talk to whoever I want to talk to and develop my own opinions. I don't want to have to tick a bunch of, you know, virtue signaling boxes when I'm talking about things. You're using, you know, virtue signaling is a, a term that we're very familiar with. Um, it almost, it's an interesting place, I guess you must find yourself in because certain elements on the left, uh, you must see them for what they are. Uh, well, I assume you feel the same way about certain elements on the right, but do you feel yourself like running in circles where you have to have more arguments with people that you would have normally thought you would agree with? on, like you said, policy issues or something? Are they attacking you for, quote unquote, I don't know, cultural type issues? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've been attacked by people on my own side, in quotations, um, and been accused of all sorts of things that are not true by people on my side um, because I, I don't take the correct position on certain issues or even really, you know, it's been it's been so difficult for people to accept the fact that I have conversations with people who might be right wing or libertarian or, you know, perhaps not feminist, who they've categorized essentially as enemies for whatever reason. And, you know, these people are I mean, I disagree with feminists on all sorts of things. And so, of course, I disagree with people who are on the right or, or libertarians or liberals or whatever you want to call any of these people. I mean, we're going to find things we agree about and find things we disagree about. And people seem to act like if you have a conversation with somebody, that means you're signing on to all of their political views and it's just ridiculous. Right. But yeah, I mean, a lot of, uh, you know, I, I've been talking a lot about free speech and free expression in the past, you know, year or two. And that seems to really bother a lot of people who might otherwise be on my side because I think they see it as sort of a dog whistle for the right. You know, for whatever reason, the left has handed over free speech to the right as far as an issue worth fighting for. So when I talk about free speech, it's like they're triggered by it. 
Um, and same things, you know, like I, I recently, and I've been criticizing cancel culture a lot. So I recently spoke out because this guy had, um, this guy, this independent, like small time kind of artist in LA had produced a t-shirt design that had a takeout box with bat wings on it that said, no thanks. And it was just sort of like a cutesy little arty design, um, and it wasn't intended to be racist. I don't think it was really intended to be political at all. I don't think he was trying to like put forth some big like criticism of China. And I think that would have been oh. fine if he was criticizing China and China should be criticized. I didn't even get that at first. Got it now. But, I, I found it hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was kind of, it was funny. It was obviously meant to be kind of jokey and kind of, cute it you know he wasn't trying to be antagonistic he wasn't even trying to ba- make a bunch of money off of it like his plan was he was going to make he made the design he was going to do 48 shirts and put them in little takeout boxes and send them out with these little fortune cookies like it was an art hmm. project to him um and a friend of his who lives in Vancouver, so where I live, and is this is now getting a bit complicated, but his his friend who lives in Vancouver was the art director for Lululemon, which is an athletic yeah, kind of yeah. yoga clothing company here. Um, and he's a close friend of my ex-boyfriend, who is a good friend of mine. <laughs> so he shared the link. Trevor shared the link on his Instagram page and some some you know, wealthy social media influencer, Dorothy Wang, saw it and essentially accused him of being racist, accused the artist of being racist, and it blew up all over the internet. The guy was fired from his job at Lululemon and vilified across media throughout the U.S. and Canada. I couldn't believe what a big story it was. It was like, why is this even a story at all? Um, the designer was vilified and I wrote an article criticizing all this saying like, you know, you're going after the wrong people. Like the only thing that's coming out of this is that Lululemon gets to protect their brand and continue to profit. And now this guy with three kids is out of a job and vilified, you know, these guys are not racist. These are not your enemies, you know, like, and just so you can go on the internet and and get a bunch of followers and likes and virtue signal about how anti-racist you are, you know, there's no conversation. Nobody's talking to the designer about what his intention was. Nobody's talking to Trevor about why he shared the link. And, and you know, as far as I was concerned, you know, if, if some people want to interpret that design as racist, that's fine. We can have that conversation. But that doesn't mean that everybody else in the world interprets it as racist. You know, it's like there's only one way to see this issue. And if you don't see it that way, then you're bad. And so if we're talking about all this, and I also said, you know, like, why is it on the left that we're not allowed to criticize China just because it's not a Western country? Like, how come I can criticize America and the American president and I can criticize you know, the Canadian prime minister, and I do all these things all the time, but we can't say a word about China without being accused of being racist. It's like China is like a superpower Mm -hmm. and there it's totally like, that's a really oppressive government. And, you know, like there's lots of things that are worth criticizing. Like we're censoring ourselves in ways that are, are really detrimental, both to people in China, but also just in general. I mean, everything should be up for criticism and you should also be able to make jokes about everything. I mean, what has happened to satire? Like, are we, we're, are we really wanting to be so humorless? Like apparently so. Yeah, it's uh, when I was young, growing up, let's say in the 80s or so, and 90s, back then, there was a very much a right-wing, religious, uh, fundamental spirit throughout the, the, at my country, at least. And I grew up thinking, well, those conservative Republican Christians, they have to judge everything. There can be no art. Um, if there's this piece of art in a gallery up in New York, and it was the least bit offensive to Christianity, they wanted it gone. They wanted it banned. They wanted to ban heavy metal music and all of this kind of stuff. It was like the cartoon version of really what I grew up with. And it's interesting. It seems the politics have flipped. And it almost seems like there's a religious fundamental view of of leftism in a way. And, and like you're saying, like, well, you can't put that um, piece of art out there. That's offensive. And it's very much different. The, the tides have switched completely 
at least from the perspective I see it uh, from. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's true. Um, And I think, I don't know, I mean, it might have something to do with kind of liberals on the left becoming more dominant in terms of the mainstream conversation and mainstream media. So maybe the right wing view or the conservative view is a bit more marginalized. But I mean, yeah, like, in the past, it was the left that was fighting for free speech. And and free speech has been incredibly important and beneficial, of course, to the marginalized groups that the left claims to fight for. But now, yeah, it seems the tables have turned. So it's no longer the right and the Christians that are trying to censor these these radicals, these activists. Um, it's the other way around. And it doesn't make much sense to me because it doesn't benefit anybody to, to get rid of free speech. We all need free speech, but it also just seems so ahistorical and and short sighted, you know, people forget history so quickly. So do you feel like um, considering like the rank and file leftist or the rank and file liberal type, do you think in their heart of hearts that they honestly see some of these logical fallacies and they're just kind of falling into groupthink or tribalism in order to signal to their comrades, no pun intended, or are they, like Buck was saying, kind of sucked into this religion where it's more, this is how it is, and I, this is the right, this is the way, you know? You know what I'm trying to say? I, I mean, I think it's both, because I think some people do just say whatever it is that they think they're supposed to say to virtue signal to their comrades, as you say, um, and are afraid to take a different line because they don't want to be attacked and ostracized and abandoned by their people sure. because it sucks. But I, I think, I think that they're, I mean, cause I know, I know women on the left and who are feminists who will say that, you know, but our speech, our speech is different because our speech is feminist speech. And so it's good speech, you know, like it's, it's righteous speech, essentially. They don't use the word righteous, but that's the argument that they're making. Because I'll say, you know, if you if you want to censor this guy's speech, what's going to stop them from censoring yours? Like, why should your speech be protected, but not his? And they're saying, you know, well, because his speech is harmful speech or dangerous speech or hateful speech or oppressive speech. And my speech is like liberatory speech and and feminist speech and speech that is like beneficial and good and ethical. And it's like they they really don't see that that's all just in the eye of the beholder and that somebody else sees your speech as hateful. And we should have all learned that from this debate around transgenderism and gender identity ideology. I mean, I certainly did that, you know, you you may well think that your speech is is right and ethical and fair and rational and and even kind, you know, it's certainly not harmful, but other people will read it completely differently and try to censor you as as a hateful bigot. I mean, you can't like who gets to decide? You know, who gets to be the dictator in these circumstances? I'm just not comfortable with anybody deciding. We have to just let it all out. We have to because the alternative is actually oppressive. What in the last, let's say, four years, what what issues have you changed most upon? Well, I mean, definitely free speech. And I don't it's not that I ever necessarily spoke out against free speech. I just didn't really bother sticking up for it very much. I didn't realize how important it was. And I think that's common to a lot of Canadians, to be honest. You know, in Canada, the free speech issue isn't such a big deal. Um, it's not something we fight for as much as you guys do in the U S it's just not part of our culture in the same way. Um, so there's that. I also, you know, I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's more that I'm interested in having conversations. So I'm interested in talking about, some problems with the believe women mantra or the me too movement and things like that, or, you know, talking about the fact that, you know, maybe there are um, ways that men and women are different and that's okay. I mean, I mean, the point shouldn't be that men and women are exactly the same and they're 
they're equally as good or at all the same things. It should be that people shouldn't be discriminated against because of their differences, um, you know, because they're born female, for example. Um, and yeah, I guess I, it, it's hard to talk about things like due process. It's hard to talk about things like, um, you know, why we can't just automatically believe all women that we actually have to investigate and ask questions. And that sometimes in this whole process, this, this me too movement, some men have been wronged and that's not okay with me. You know, like it's not, it's not okay. Or it's not true to say, oh, well, those men will be fine because, you know, just, just because you're a man doesn't mean you don't need a job or you don't need a community or you don't need friends and that it's okay to cancel you from the world and vilify you across the internet and, and kick you out of your, your city or your community or whatever. Um, so I guess, and I, I mean, and of course I've also changed my mind about talking to the right because I think in the past I did sort of see it as problematic to, I'm putting this in quotations and air quotes, ally with the right to have conversations with people that we've deemed our political enemies. I don't even see those people necessarily as political enemies anymore. Um, I don't, I don't see things in such a black and white way. And I sort of want to talk to all sorts of people and, and understand where they're coming from. Um, it doesn't mean all people are good or well-intentioned, but I do think that a lot of people are good and well-intentioned. And I think those are people that in the past I would have written off as unethical or bad because they didn't agree with me on, on various political positions. And I just, I just don't see things like that anymore. So, so talking about kind of your perspectives in the past, as you, as you just put it, um, was there a particular moment or a particular issue where you started to kind of question these uh, circles or echo chambers you were in that challenged the orthodox ideology of that particular circle you were participating in? Well, I mean, I think that the gender identity debate really opened my eyes to this because, you know, I was, I was made to realize that how, how important free and open debate was because it wasn't happening. Um, and because, you know, I'm so unafraid of debate, you know, I, I don't, I don't have a problem debating people who I disagree with or I don't like or who are my so-called enemies, but other people, especially on the left, really do have a problem with that. You know, they won't debate me. They won't sit on a panel with me. They won't even do, you know, a media conversation. They won't do, you know, a, a conversation on radio or TV if I'm going to be a participant because they'll be tainted by my evilness, I guess. Um, so, so that issue, but I mean, also just in general, you know, trying to have conversations with some certain feminists and leftists, particularly on the internet, I'll say, you know, it's sort of, <laughs> I've had a different experience when I talk to people in real life. It's not so hard to talk about these issues when you talk to people in real life. People are a lot more understanding sure. and usually you, you do end up agreeing on most issues and everyone seems pretty reasonable, but in on online, it, it sort of uh, doesn't play out like that. Right. So, you know, I, I've asked questions about, you know, um, it's, I don't want to get into the whole story, but there was a man here in Vancouver who was accused of something, you know, we were all to assume it was sexual assault, but nobody would tell anybody else what actually happened. So none of us knew what happened, but we were all expected to vilify him. He was fired from his job. Um, you know, he lost his entire career. He was a writer um, and he was the head of the creative writing department at the University of British Columbia here in Vancouver. And so it kind of tore the Canadian literary community apart. And those who sort of spoke out, not even necessarily in defense of him, but in defense of due process, saying, you know, we're we're vilifying him and we're deciding his fate on social media. And none of us even have any information you know, the media was reporting on him, but but they weren't reporting on what he supposedly did. So no one was even in a position to decide what should happen to this guy, if he should lose his job, if he should lose his career, if he needed to be charged with anything. 
And the position that you were supposed to take in feminism and, you know, on the progressive left was that this guy was a bad guy and we needed to believe women. We needed to believe that the accusers were accusing him of something worth vilifying him for. And I was so frustrated by this because I was like, I'm not, I, I was, I was just, I wasn't taking a position. I was saying, I can't take a position. I can't take a position either way. I don't know anything about what's going on. And, and, you know, it, it was really troubling to me that, you know, Margaret Atwood was one of the people who signed on to some letter in support of due process. And she was vilified across the internet. And we couldn't even have a conversation about this. I was just kind of like shut down and like beaten down saying like, no, like he's terrible. He's done awful things and you're just going to have to trust us. And it's like, (laughs) okay, like this is ridiculous. Like I'm, I understand why it's important to believe women, of course, because historically women have not been believed and most women who've been raped or abused don't ever, um, are never kind of vindicated. You know, their, their abuser or their rapist is for the most part not charged. Um, and there's a long history of saying, you know, oh, she's probably lying or oh, she's exaggerating or she's just like an embittered ex or a jilted ex or something like that. And I've been in those situations, too. I've been I was in an abusive relationship. And when I uh, left the guy and came out about it, a whole bunch of people I was living in a small community at the time, you know, didn't believe me. And it was really kind of traumatic. And they kind of turned around and ostracized me and vilified me. And it was awful. So, like, I get it. But at the same time, we do have to be reasonable reasonable, and use our rational brains and not treat people like they're disposable just because they're men or just because they're white or just because they're cis or whatever this, like, hierarchy of oppression we've created where (laughs) somebody's automatically on on top because they have this specific identity that's been assigned to them i mean it's totally dehumanizing the the term feminist gets thrown around quite a bit and i'm sure you would agree that it's it's uh, gone through changes and you know there's a lot of misinformation about the term out there how would you describe the version, and I almost hate using that term, the version of feminist that you are, and I, I'm not trying to uh, downgrade your version or make sure that, the, you know, there's different levels of it, but how would you, I, I kind of hold you up as like the big famous feminist around. And so I'd like you to define it as you see it. I mean, I I define feminism, I, it's so tough now because people will define feminism in all sorts of different ways. And people understand feminism in all sorts of different ways. And people will call themselves a feminist and have quite different views than I do. So the the word is, is a difficult one to use nowadays. But I mean, essentially, I see feminism as a fight against the oppression of or the discrimination of, of women, you know, discrimination against a person because they are born female. But particularly, I see it as a fight against violence against women. So, you know, the most important issues in feminism, I think, should be around things like domestic violence, um, rape, uh, prostitution, which is obviously an incredibly violent and harmful and exploitative industry. Um, I think that pornography is really harmful. I think pornography sexualizes violence against women. I think it's obviously incredibly degrading and exploitative and misogynistic. I think it's incredibly racist also. Um, Things like FGM um, are still going on in lots of places in the world. In lots of places in the world, women really are not able to function as independent, autonomous people. Um, So... I mean, I guess I'm getting into that thing where I sort of have started to feel like it's more important to talk about the actual issues than the, right. the labels themselves, because the labels are misused and misunderstood and interpreted in, in wildly different ways, depending on who you're talking to. Right. Almost like left wing, right wing, et cetera. It just kind of blurs these days. In closing, I guess I, I wanted to ask you, I assume you somewhat follow the what's going on here in the States politically. And uh, the Me Too movement was a big deal. There was a lot of pushback uh, against Donald Trump because of that movement, basically, the the marches after he got elected. Um, there's an interesting silence from a lot of them 
on Joe Biden. Um, I guess he's had an accuser or two come out and say, you know, he's done something that was inappropriate years and years ago. What are your thoughts on the Believe All Women movement and then how it's kind of uh, become hushed when it's their guy that's getting accused? Well, I mean, I don't think it necessarily gets hushed when it's their guy who's accused because we saw men like Al Franken taken down. You know, we've seen we've seen liberal men taken down by the Me Too movement. So their politics didn't necessarily keep them safe from that wrath. Uh, I think in this case, it's just that people are so desperate to keep Trump out that they don't think it's necessarily worth it to get rid of Biden if that means that Trump's going to win again. And I guess I see that as fair. Like you kind of have to weigh what's 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 worth it. Um, and I, I mean, I don't particularly like Biden. I really don't like Trump either. Um, but I'm glad that I'm not in a position where I have to choose. <laughs> you lucky Canadian. <laughs> yeah. But. I mean, like I would have voted for Bernie Sanders if I could. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I guess I think it's I think it's sort of fair and I don't and I don't again, I don't think that we have to believe all women. Um, and I'm I don't know if Tara Reed's accusations are true or not. She's not um her story has changed a lot, so she's not sort of the ideal person to be making these accusations. So I I can't say for sure that I necessarily believe her or don't believe her. So I don't know. You know, it's a pretty hard, it's a pretty hard situation to take a stand on, honestly, and to to get rid of him over these particular accusations um might be unwise as if you're if you're that opposed to Trump, if you really don't want Trump to to win again. Um, and just real quick, dovetailing off of off of that, in the context of uh, Canadian politics, do you feel like whether it be the trans movement or the Believe All Women movement is in any way being co-opted by the establishment for any kind of political gain or power grab? Um, no, not in the same way that that it may be is in the US. Um, the the Believe Women and the Me Too movement, I mean, it it did have it did have an impact in Canada for sure, but not as big an, of an impact. And that's partly just because we don't have big celebrities here. Um, you know, the Me Too movement was so centered around these these powerful men and these big well-known celebrities. And that's not really our culture here. So the Me Too movement in Canada had more of an impact on sort of a smaller level, interestingly. You know, there would be sort of guys in the local DJ scene or the bar scene who were being taken down due to accusations. Um, so it hasn't ever become such a like establishment thing here. And, you know, I'm I'm trying to think of whether or not even any politicians were were impacted, probably in a little bit, uh, uh, you know, here and there. But it just, it, 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 it didn't happen. It didn't play out as, in the same way as it did in the U.S., just because we're so much smaller and, um, you know, population-wise and, and, you know, different, we're different politically and culturally. I just hope Brian Adams doesn't break my heart the way Bill Cosby did. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I'm not really a Brian Adams fan, so I don't really care either way. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me neither. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not what the summer of 69 meant, Bobby. Mm. Um, Megan, before we, before we get you out of here, uh, I actually forgot initially to let you discuss uh, your website and what you do in at uh, Feminist Current and everything. Oh, right. Yeah. So my website is feministcurrent.com. Um, I've also just started, you know, in January, actually, I started a YouTube show called The Same Drugs. So yes. um, it's on YouTube and we're podcasting also. And I actually started that show so that I could sort of talk about things outside the realm of feminism. So I've been able to interview people 
um, that wouldn't have sort of fit with the the feminist current platform. So that's been really nice. And sort of I've been able to branch out and talk about some other issues outside of feminism. So uh, yeah, find me on YouTube. I have a a Patreon, um, which I should promote more than I do. I always forget, but that's sort of like, you know, most of my income comes from donations essentially. So I'm sort of dependent on people supporting my work, just, you know, people who like what I do or appreciate what I do and who are willing to um, send me five bucks a month because that all adds up. So yeah, if you want to check out my Patreon, we also, I, I put content up there um, that doesn't go up publicly online um, and you can also donate through feministcurrent.com and you can find me on Facebook and Instagram, but not Twitter. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> banned, banned from Twitter. Well, I will link to all of those in the show notes page for this episode. And I, I would get people emailing me once in a while saying, why do you only have libertarians on? It's just going to be an echo chamber and see guys. I have had Megan Murphy now on twice and um, ah. yes, Megan, thank you so much for being uh, back here on Death to Tyrants. I've, I've loved chatting with you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks for having me on. It was fun to talk. All right. I enjoyed doing that bonus episode. It was fun having a co-host and it was always, it's always fun talking to Megan Murphy. What a cool person. And Megan, uh, honestly, thank you again for being on this show. Uh, it's nice to reach out to people uh, from different political perspectives, yet uh, they're still smart. At least they're red pilled, you know. We're, we don't want blue pilled nut jobs on the show, basically. So, again, Megan, thank you very much. And uh, this is a bonus episode. Hope you've enjoyed it. Until next time, we'll see ya. You get split in fucking half. Cause I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmically equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash a science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris. Like the sound of the Death to Tyrants podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.